Okay. Uh, the morning or almost noon, everybody. So my name's Todd Hilton. I work for a small company called Brain Corporation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, before coming to Brain Corporation, I was at DARPA, and uh, I started the Synapse Project, which many of you know about. <clears throat> and I also started another project called Physical Intelligence, which only a few of you here um, had contact with. Uh, they had sort of different uh, themes and focuses to them. But what I thought I would do today is instead of talking about Brain Corporation, most of, most of which I'm not prepared to talk about yet, um, and if you want to know what we're doing, please go to our website. We've got a little computer you can buy and build a robot with, if that's your thing. What I thought I'd do instead is to speak to you as a community uh, and give you some perspective, given my experiences both as a DARPA program manager and now as being at Brain Corporation and looking at you guys as a community. So the title of this talk is Why Neuromorphic Computing is Different and Difficult. <clears throat> and so before I get started, I decided I would write down what I think some basic neuromorphic computing proposition is. This is the thing that's going on in the back of our mind somehow when usually we're talking about why we're doing neuromorphic computing and what we want to accomplish. So this is what I wrote. We want to build computers that learn and generalize in a broad variety of, t variety of tasks, much as human brains are able to do, in order to employ them in applications that require currently too much human effort. That's sort of the basic idea behind neuromorphic computing. Now, I think there are a number of challenges associated with this proposition, and I'm going to go through them, having lived with them. I had exactly the same proposition uh, at DARPA, um, and I want to tell you what I learned in the process of sort of pursuing this basic idea. I mean, on the face of it, you would have to say the people who wrote this might be crazy because this would have to be one of the hardest things that humanity has ever attempted to do. So now I'm going to tell you in detail, uh, well, not in detail, but it is a list, actually, of why I think it's very hard. So I have a top 10 list for you, the top 10 reasons why neuromorphic computing is different and difficult. Number 10, these are not necessarily in order of importance, but roughly, okay? Number 10, neuroscience is too little help. Um, we can't possibly simulate all the detail of a biological brain, even if we had all the detail. We don't really understand the function of even very simple nervous systems, especially when they're applied to whole organisms in a, in a, in a real world setting. There are far, far, far too observables, too few observables, I should say, com that come from neuroscience that can guide the development of a model or technology. There are simply a whole pile of assumptions that you have to stick in, in addition to what the neuroscience may say you should be doing, to actually make anything that works. Okay. Number nine, <clears throat> computational neural models are too little help. Um, and this is a similar sort of problem. I'm just, just coming at it from a slightly different perspective. But basically, there are too many assumptions in these models. There are too many parameters. There's no general organizing principle. Um, the models are usually incomprehensible after you build them. Um, and there's an unclear connection to applications. So it doesn't really address the fundamental proposition that I had at the beginning. Eight, other things that are too little help. For example, cortical column hypothesis, sparse distributed representations, spiking neural networks, STDP, hierarchies of simple and complex cells. You know, insert your favorite ideas here. I'm not saying that these aren't good ideas. Many of them are very good ideas and can be, and can be very helpful in designing a technology, but they're not sufficient. And for that reason, it's hard to really say whether they matter. And unfortunately, you can't know whether they matter until you build a whole system and show that it satisfies that basic proposition, which nobody has yet done. So, you know, some of my favorite ideas, you know, that are also too little help are things like spatial temporal invariance and critical, critical criticality and uh, causal entropic forcing. But there are dozens of others, and you'll hear them. You'll hear a lot of them. And usually there's a proponent for each of these, or several proponents for each of these as being the key thing. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's legitimate. I don't think that's sufficient. Number seven, <clears throat> there's a whole system requirement. Uh, as, as Jerry Edelman always used to say, you know, brains are embodied and bodies are embedded in an environment in the real world. And so what that means is that if you're going to test a neuromorphic computer, you unfortunately not only have to build the computer and all the software layers and all the stuff to do that, but you have to embed it in some sort of complex body, be it real or virtual, and then put that in a world which can test whether or not you satisfy your neuromorphic proposition or not. It's an extraordinarily large and difficult thing to do. 
Number six, whole system interdependence. Brains, bodies, and, and environments are complex systems whose large-scale function, almost certainly, I would say, cannot be analytically expressed in terms of its lower-level structure and dynamics. It's basically the complex systems hypothesis that says that you get emergent behavior from the interaction of many simple components, but you can't necessarily describe that at a global scale in any simple way. <clears throat> and for this reason, system, met system design methodologies are generally inadequate because the system cannot be decomposed into independent parts. That makes building anything a real pain in the neck because you can't easily isolate one piece of the system and say, this piece does X, and it fits into this big, and then it connects to this box that does Y. It just simply doesn't work because if you build a piece X, it will unfortunately be through all the feedback in the system have an effect on itself probably at some later time, which is very, very hard to understand. Number five, <clears throat> there is no path for technology evolution in this field. The problem is that the benchmark for performance comparison is either a human or it is a well-engineered domain-specific solution. And so as you can see, there's very, very, there, there are no, I have never been able to find a simple set of problems going from here's a simple thing that proves the case to a more complicated thing that proves the case that anybody gives a damn about along the way. Massive computing resources are required. Given that, that benchmark problem that I just mentioned, um, any model that does anything that anyone will care about will require a massive computational resource for both development and implementation. The development is slow and expensive. You can, for example, if you can get access to a huge computing system, you still won't be able to run your systems in real time. And you'll still spend days debugging stupid things and single models because you can't turn them around. So what this means is that, as many people have stated here today, that custom hardware and a state-of-the-art process is needed for any large-scale application. I think that's absolutely true. However, I think there's also um, a sense that somehow, you know, we could, like, if we could build the hardware first, then we'd figure out what the algorithms were, or if we could figure out what the algorithms were, then we'd build the hardware. I don't think either of these is a healthy response. They are interdependent. Um, the hardware informs the software and vice versa. If you just go off into algorithm land, you can do all kinds of stuff that's, in, that's not practically computable. And if you just go off into hardware land, you can build hardware that's not useful for anything. So it's a problem. Number three, competition for resources. So the norm, normorphic computing, you know, lives in a world in which other projects are competing for the same money. This is the problem that I'm describing. So it's easy for anyone who doesn't like your project to claim that <clears throat> it, is making no com it is making no progress. It is not competitive with the state of the art, and you are doing it wrong. Okay? And then there's my favorite. This is my personal favorite. Todd is an idiot. <laughs> So the reason I brought this up is that this is a perspective you get as a DARPA program manager each and every day, right? And you, you find yourself trying to defend a project against a bunch of other projects where the propositions are much simpler and the goals are much more well-defined. Okay. Number two, <clears throat> computers can compute anything. So you start with a computer. It's essentially a blank slate. There are no constraints built into it. Um, changing the computer architecture essentially only changes the classes of algorithms that it computes efficiently. So if you, if you start with a computer, you better know everything about what needs to be done to build that brain if that's your goal. Because the computer has no idea. Number one, brains are not computers. So I think most people here know that, but oftentimes when we're talking about what we're doing, we slide in and out between an assumption that a brain is a computer or it's not a computer. And I think that's dangerous. So brains are thermodynamical, biochemical, phys physical systems that spontaneously self-organized when exposed to the world. 
but computers are symbolic processors executing algorithms designed by humans. So there's a very, very different thing here. Our assumption in neuromorphic computing is that we can, in fact, define the models or the constraints that we can place onto a computer which will effectively simulate, emulate, or do what it is a brain does. Okay. Lastly, just a little, little conundrum for me has always been, so brains design computers, is it reasonable to suppose that we could build a neuromorphic computer that would design a brain? I don't know. The, the point here is that brains may, be, may, brains may be capable of doing things that computers simply can't do because they're more general than, than computers are. So a few additional thoughts. Now, I've probably offended everybody in the room. That was not my intention, of course. I, I just think I, I just wanted to lay it out the way I saw it, is why this is such a hard thing to do. And again, it all hinges on that original proposition about what neuromorphic computing is. OK, so a few additional thoughts. So machine learning. So I like to say that machine learning algorithms are neuromorphic computing algorithms that actually work. So, with a small smile there. Machine learning algorithms have mathematical expressions describing what they do. And for this reason, people can create algorithms and put them on machines, computers, and have them do something. If you don't have a mathematical description for what it is you're trying to do, it's going to be awfully hard to stick it on a computer and have your computer do anything that you want it to do. OK, so by analogy, a neuromorphic computer, computer satisfying this original proposition would require a mathematical formulation of the brain. So is this possible? Is this reasonable? I have made a few arguments along the way that said that, well, it might not be. Certainly not proven. It's certainly a very substantial assumption, if it is true. And if it is true, how would we go about figuring it out? And I think the question of how we would go about figuring it out might be a very different question than how do we build a neuromorphic computer. OK, so what are the things that we can surely do? Things that are in our control where we can certainly make progress. We can certainly build new kinds of computers that are capable of efficiently executing new classes of algorithms. That we can do. That we, in fact, are doing. And we can certainly build better machine learning algorithms. Those things we can surely do. But I wanted to uh, go back and examine the original proposition again and, and give some alternative, I think, somewhat more practical propositions for neuromorphic computing. Several, three of them, in fact. So the first proposition is what I call a user-focused neuromorphic computing proposition. It says, we will build a computer to enable, for example, comput computational neuroscientists to efficiently model large neural systems or analysts to more, to more easily understand video, or some other thing that some class of users wants to do and has a problem. Now, my comment about this particular proposition is that it's a long way from an engineering specification. It's a, it's a lot, although it, although it is a real thing, it's a long way from saying, you know, this is what the hardware, low-level software looks like that's going to do this thing. Second one is an algorithm-focused neuromorphic computing proposition. It says, we will build a computer that efficiently computes certain classes of, for example, machine learning algorithms. And my comment here is that um, this proposition may lead to very narrowly focused systems, so ASICs that are really good at doing one or maybe a few things, um, which is not really the goal of neuromorphic computing in general. We're not trying to build ASICs that are good at a particular algorithm. And if we were trying to do that, who would care if it's a neural, neurally inspired model or not? So there are challenges with this proposition as well. And lastly, you know, what I would call an architecture-focused neuromorphic computing proposition. You know, we will build a computer featuring the following architectural concepts, which, for example, may be inspired by what we think is important about the brain. For example, sparse distributed representation, event-based execution, asynchronous communication, distributed computation, comp neural columnar computational primitives, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that you could hypothesize that you're going to bake into your architecture as an element of it. And having done that, you would come up with a specification for a system that you can actually build. All right? You actually have to get to this point to build anything. So here you sort of start with a proposition about what the basic architecture is, and you build it, and then you see what the heck it can do afterwards. So it isn't obvious, of course, from such propositions you know, what this computer will be good at or used for. 
Okay, so, so what's changed in seven years? And many people already said these things, so but I'll give you a little bit of my own perspective on it. Okay, so remember, in, in, I started working on the Synapse Project in 2007. So in 2007, neuromorphic was certainly not the buzzword of the year. And uh, there was essentially little, if any, support or recognition within at least the DOD spaces that I was working in of the potential for neuromorphic computing. Uh, the community was highly fragmented. There were no meetings like this where there's such a diverse group of people working on it. Um, and so it was a much different situation. So there has been, I think, qualitatively, a very big change in our you know, capacity to work on this problem than we had seven years ago. And that's a, that's a very good thing. I think we should take advantage of that. And for that reason, numerous large-scale efforts in neuromorphic computing now exist. You can get a job now. You can, you can go on a bulletin board, and it says, I'm looking for somebody who knows something about neuromorphic computing and get a job. Yeah, there was almost none of that seven years ago. And these are jobs at you know, organizations that are trying to make money. Um, so deep learning algorithms have matured and are being deployed. Uh, 2007, deep learning was still very much a research enterprise, and not a lot of people really understood it or what it would be good for, but now it's clearly coming of age in application space. And also, you know, more broadly, the, the world is sort of aware of and interested in brain-related technology and projects, as indicated by the Brain Initiative and the Human Brain Project. So it is, the situation is qualitatively different. The problems that we have, however, are really not that much different. Uh, much of the things that were said today were, I said, almost identical things when I started the uh, Synapse Project. So I think, however, we might be at a kind of inflection point in the evolution of the technology. Uh, the way I see it, the evolution goes something like this. You have some user stories. This goes to the various propositions I was just talking about. You have some user stories, some idea. You have some algorithms that sort of you think serve those users. You have some architectures you think that serve the algorithms. There may be some primitives in between that, that Murat talked about that connect these two. Um, and then there may be implementations. This goes to hardware and so forth and how you do it. But this is an evolutionary path. You, know, you, have, to go, you have to do all of these things and feed back to the users and you have to keep going and going. So we're going to have to do this a bunch of times, probably with a bunch of different systems, before we find the ones that are actually valuable. But I think we've begun finally. Um, this, there are, as I said, there are, a lot, there are numerous large-scale neuromorphic computing efforts going on, both in industry and in academia. Systems are being built. I think they're from the Synapse Project, I expect, although I, haven't, I don't know much about what's going on anymore, that there should be some very interesting announcements this year about whole systems that actually do stuff, you know, at significant scale. Um, so I think the, the evolution has begun, and we need to make sure as a community that we are actively fostering the continued growth of this field. And so I have a recommendation for the community, which is that we separate or classify our efforts into roughly two domains. And it's not that these two domains don't interact with each other. It's just a way of clarifying what our basic proposition is about what we're doing. One domain or one class would be aspirational efforts that are mostly focused on the basic neuromorphic computing proposition where you have questions like, how does the brain work and how do I build a machine that works like a brain? Now, the second one would be more practical efforts focused on building new and useful computers, serving some class of user stories, supporting some number of algorithms, using some basic architectural principles that are distinguishable and different from the way we do things now, and for that reason, perhaps very valuable. And I would avoid the temptation to straddle both domains, which is what we typically do. The reason I would avoid that temptation is that in the aspirational efforts, there are a number of very basic research questions that if they were tied to requirements that they were translated into technology would likely go nowhere. And there are also many different ways of thinking about how it is to get to the root of what the brain does, and you don't want to shut them out by sort of focusing on an, in an eventual implementation for them. And then on the practical side, um, Again, for example, as I said before, you can, you, we, could, we can and we are building computers now that are, that are different and that are focused on different algorithms and different applications. If we were to describe 
ourselves as a community to the, to the world which funds us and employs us and so forth to say that we're doing these two things, all right? On the pra I, I, I may, at Brain Corporation, I'm focused mostly on the practical side of things because we're trying to build and sell stuff. And I want stuff that actually works so I can sell it, so I can make money. When the money comes in, I hire people, the community grows, there's an economy, the place, everything gets bigger. Right? We need that. This field is way too small given its proposition. Right? We need a lot more people and a lot more money. The only way to get that is to create businesses that generate money and jobs so that when the postdocs and the graduate students leave the universities, their expertise isn't lost, it's captured, recycled in a business. So, so that's the practical leg. And I think if you take the practical leg and you give it the goal of building a brain, it will likely create nothing. Because it do, we don't know how to do it. We can't write an equation for anything, so we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna do it. We're, we're most likely going to fail. So by splitting the domains and then creating some bridges between them so that they inform each other, we can, I think, attack both of the, both of the issues at the same time. 